Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar, Farm to Summer, Incorporating Local Foods into Your Summer Meals Menu. This webinar is one in a larger summer meal series listed here. Last month, we talked about engaging community partners in summer meal planning. Today, we're talking about Farm to Summer. And next month, we'll be talking about strategies to improve the summer meals experience for kids and families. I want to mention quickly that we'll be sending today's webinar recording and a copy of the slide deck to your inbox after the webinar, but you can always access our webinar recordings and our slide decks and register for upcoming webinars on our website, bestpractices.nokidhungry.org. Um, this is the best place to access all of the No Kid Hungry training opportunities and resources. Um, I'd also encourage you to visit the site and sign up for our monthly newsletter to receive updates on new resources we have, upcoming webinars, partner updates, and other events of interest directly to your inbox. Um, so let's dive into the content of today's webinar. First, we're going to talk about why Farm to Summer is a great opportunity for sponsors to improve their summer meals program and invest in local communities, which will include an overview of Farm to Summer strategies and activities. Um, then I'm going to kick it over to my colleagues in California who will talk about a USDA Farm to Summer competition that they held in California, including stories from the summer meal sponsors who participated. And after that, we'll pause briefly for some Q&A. So please, throughout today's webinar, go ahead and submit your questions as you have them. We'll answer them during the Q&A break. Or if we don't have enough time to get to all of your questions today, we will follow up with you via email. So after that first brief Q&A, my colleague and dear friend Donna Martin will cover all of her tips, tricks, and strategies for procuring local foods, from menu planning to communicating with local farmers to awarding bids. Um, you're going to hear, as Donna calls it, the good, the bad, and the ugly of procuring local food, so make sure you stay tuned um, for Donna's infinite wisdom. So let me introduce you to today's speakers. My name is Emily Pia. I'm a program manager at No Kid Hungry Center for Best Practices, working on summer meals here. Um, you might have heard of my other colleague, Derek Lambert, who is also a summer meals uh, manager on our No Kid Hungry Center for Best Practices. So I'm jumping in today to prevent on, present on Farm to Summer, but you'll also probably hear a lot from him. Um, I'm also joined today by Lori Pennings, who is the Farm to School Lead at the Nutrition Services Division at the California Department of Education, um, and Vince Coggin, who is the Director of Nutrition Services and Warehousing at Natomas Unified School District, also in California. And then finally, Donna Martin, who is the Director of the School Nutrition Program in Burke County Public Schools, which is in Georgia. So as promised, we're going to start off with why Farm to Summer. And so we really like to think of Farm to Summer as a win for children, for farmers, and for communities. Children benefit by having access to fresh, healthy, nutritious foods year-round. Um, additionally, if you have Farm to Summer activities available at your site, children benefit from having enrichment year-round as well. Um, we know that activities and programming make it more likely for children to come to sites. Activities also combat summer learning loss. And in the case of Farm to Summer, activities can create lifelong habits around eating healthy foods. Farmers benefit by having a market to sell to, especially in months of agricultural abundance. Um, and if you're a school sponsoring summer meals and you decide to procure locally year-round, you're giving farmers in your area a reliable market to sell to year-round and a sustainable source of income. And communities benefit from the increased investment in the local economy. Um, I also like to think of summer meal sponsors and, as an essential part of that community. Um, so I'd be remiss not to mention the positive impacts of Farm to Summer on summer meals programs, um, which includes sites and sponsors benefiting from increased participation due to increased meal quality and our activities associated with Farm to Summer. Um, so I want to ground our conversation today in a little bit of research that underscores um, that benefit of procuring local foods, which is attendance at sites. In 2013, No Kid Hungry commissioned some research and surveyed parents of lower socioeconomic status about why they would or would not attend summer meal sites. Um, according to families, healthy, wholesome meals were necessary for 62% of the respondents to attending a summer meal site. So as it pertains to our conversation today, procuring local foods is a great way for sponsors and sites to plan attractive menus and provide healthy meals for children over the summer. And in turn, healthier meals can increase and sustain participation over the summer. 
Um, for some additional context, in case you're wondering, this was the second most important factor in attending summer meal sites, the first being site safety from that research study. So farm to summer doesn't mean that you have to have local foods on your menu every single day. This slide shows just some of the many ways that you can incorporate local foods into your summer meals program in 2020. Farm to summer for you could be, especially if you're just starting out, inviting a local farmer to your summer meal site to teach kids about farming um, and maybe do some taste testing with their products. We'll hear some great examples of that in just a bit from Vince. You might also consider doing a harvest of the month menu item, which I know a lot of schools do that during the year. Um, but over the summer, maybe, for example, you could make local peaches the focus of July and try putting them on your menu a couple times that month. Um, maybe you also plan some activities around those peaches to get at the enrichment and education part of the farm to school puzzle, uh, farm to summer puzzle. Maybe you're a sponsor, though, with some more experience procuring local foods in the summer you really want to ramp up your program. Um, Donna will walk you through procuring local food so that you can have something local on your menu three, four, or five times per week like she does. Um, so with that quick overview of the benefits of Farm to Summer and some ideas to get your gears turning, I am going to turn it over to Lori to introduce California's Farm to Summer Challenge. Good morning, everyone, um, and thank you for having California share our experience implementing the Farm to Summer Week Challenge. This all started in 2018. USDA asked all states if they were interested in promoting a Farm to Summer Week Challenge, and they actually developed this, this initiative. So the challenge consists of three things um, to do once during each week, I mean one week. So the first thing is to serve a minimum of one locally sourced food item, and they referred to this activity as taste. Host a minimum of one educational food activity, and they referred to this as teach and share their Farm to Summer Week Challenge activities at least once through social media or their website or in some way with the community. And this was referred to as Connect. So in 2018, we started a bit late, and we had one sponsor complete the challenge. So in 2019, we started a little bit earlier and decided to offer a webinar. We had nine speakers who were willing to provide assistance um, to our summer sponsors with local foods, or actually coming out and providing a nutrition education activity. We surveyed our sponsors and found the week of June 24th to 28th was the best week for them. Um, some of our sponsors end their uh, summer program early, and so this gave an opportunity for everyone to participate. Um, so after we had our webinar, we surveyed our sponsors and asked them what help they needed, and then we tried to match up our partners in the community um, with their needs. So next slide. So this was the result after Farm to Summer Week in 2019. We had 27 sponsors participate, um, which means they did at least one of the three activities. 11 sponsors actually completed the challenge and received that beautiful little handcrafted trophy there. Um, 220 sites included Farm to Summer Week activities, and over 60,000 meals were served uh, with locally sourced food items. Next slide. Here are some interesting findings. Almost all of our sponsors were already serving lo locally sourced foods daily, even before Farm to Summer Week. The majority of summer meal sponsors held taste testing or cooking demonstrations. And when we asked what local food items they served, we found that all of our sponsors were serving local fruits or vegetables, over half served local milk, 40% served a local grain, and 25% served a local meat or a meat alternate. Next slide. When we asked them where they purchased the local food items, we found that two-thirds purchased local foods directly from a farmer or it should say farmer's market. Almost 50% purchased local foods from their regular distributor, one-third purchased from their vendor or food service management company, one-third purchased local foods from USDA DOD Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program, and interesting, almost 30% serve local foods from a garden. Next slide. When it came to the second requirement, implementing an education activity, I think it's really important to note that half of our summer meal sponsors used education lessons that were developed from someone else, so they didn't come up with these activities themselves. There are many free resources you can download, so you definitely don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, some examples are on the slide um, that were used, Dairy Council of California, 
the Center for Eco Literacy, and USDA Team Nutrition Materials. The posters on the slide can all be downloaded from the Center for Eco Literacy website. Another interesting finding was that more than half of our summer meal sponsors received help implementing nutrition education activities. Some of the sites had local health department staff come out, provide lessons using Harvest of the Month materials. The Dairy Council of California visited a site with a farmer and a dairy cow. One summer meal sponsor had the Girl Scouts come out and provide a nutrition education activity so they could earn a badge. Another sponsor had a master gardener come out. One had a local mobile library come to a park and read books featuring fruits and vegetables to the children. So there are many possibilities to partner with organizations in your community. Next. I wanted to highlight two of our summer meal sponsors. Um, the first one is San Luis Coastal Unified School District. Um, this slide shows how they implemented the challenge. They purchased local strawberries from a farm that was 140 miles away, and they put them on their salad bar. They also created strawberry lassie in a blender made from strawberries and yogurt and served it to the kids. For the education activities, they used the handout titled About Strawberries, which was from the Center for Eco Literacy Abundant California Enrichment Materials. Again, I can't stress enough for you to review these materials that are available. They're just professional and um, already done for you. So in this case, they printed out the handout and the children reviewed the different parts of a strawberry plant. The materials also provided six interesting facts about strawberries, which they reviewed with the kids. And they read the book, No Ordinary Apple, which is about eating mindfully. And because they had strawberries on the menu, they changed the word apple to strawberries. So the bottom line is professional resources are, are available at no charge for you to use. In addition to these activities, they had the local health department staff come to one site and conduct a Rethink Your Drink activity, and the Dairy Council of California came out and talked to the kids about local dairy. Next slide. So the third activity is to post what you did on social media. So what San Luis Coastal Unified School District did was post this Instagram post here. Uh, which really proudly showcases her amazing program with the community, and it also acknowledges the organizations in the community that provided assistance with education activities. So the next school district I wanted to highlight is Natomas Unified School District, and we have Vince Coggin here on the phone with us. Uh, he did an amazing job, and he's uh, with us to share his experience. Take it away, Vince. Thank you, Lori. So as a, as a food service director, with, as an educator, um, if I want to teach kids about fruits and veggies, the prime season to do that is during the summer. Uh, unfortunately, most of us don't operate throughout the summer in, on top of the um, summer feeding program. So I want to use the best um, foods and the best curriculum as possible. If I go to the salad bars now, even to the farmer's market, we're growing a lot of um, apples and we're growing a lot of oranges. But during the summer, we have things like stone fruits, tomatoes, corn, that make teaching about fruits and vegetables much easier to the kids. So with that, during the farm to school week, we did a couple things. One, we took our um, no Kid Hungry food truck, called the Lunchbox, out to specific sites and made summer meals much more enjoyable by serving out of a food truck. Two, we handed out seeds donated from the Dairy Council to our students at the meal sites. But the one that stood out the most is the farmers actually visiting our summer school sites and teaching them about the different varieties of tomatoes. So in picture here, I have farmer Shane, a local farmer with Fire Ginger Farms. Shane and Hope went out to the summer school site and taught the kids about different um, tomato varieties, the early girl, Carolina, um, grape tomatoes, etc., and gave kids descriptive words on how to um, descriptive words how to describe these types of tomatoes instead of it's good, it's, it's yucky, it's, it tastes yum. They're using words like, it tastes tangy, juicy, acidic, um, and it just tastes plain. So 
through partnership with our local farmer and a partnership with Center for Eco Literacy. Um, and Lori and Heather came out from CDE. They went out and observed uh, different varieties of lessons that Farmer Shane and Hope were able to give to the students. In response, we will go to the next slide. Um, the kids liked it overall. So we get a resounding thumbs up from the kids of, of tasting it. Um, I saw personally at that school site, um, the tomatoes flying off the shelf from the salad bar, which is no surprise. And from that, you know, they were able to um, go to the farmer's market and see different tomatoes that they came up with. So ending that lesson, the kids got to try it in salsa form like you see, saw in that picture. And some of the parents who I knew personally who the kids got to take certain tomatoes home told me about the salsa that they made at home. So it enhanced the actual uh, lesson. They took it home and they made salsa with the family. So um, that's the benefit of farm to school. It makes for better teaching materials than we do throughout the other seasons. We get all the fun stuff with summer um, and get to teach our kids to go along with it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori and Vince for presenting. A um, Couple questions for you. Um, Vince, first, where did you get the ideas for your farm to summer activities? Um, did you use a curriculum or did you have to develop that plan, um, including all of those adjectives that you had the kids describe the tomatoes with um, did you come up with that yourself or did you use a um, curriculum? So I've used an existing curriculum, uh, part of being, I think one of the great resources that we have, it, we're in California, we're surrounded by a lot of agencies who have developed these materials already. So the curriculum taught was specific to Center for Eco Literacy, um, but being surrounded with California Department of Food and Ag, Dairy Council, they had other materials that we could choose from. And the seeds also came as a donation from um, Dairy Council. And then the truck use came with a grant from uh, No Kid Hungry. Great. Um, we have another question for Lori. Are you able to share the survey that you use to collect your data in California? And if so, I can send it as part of the follow-up. Yes, definitely. Um, USDA actually provide us with a pre and a post survey to use as a template. Um, so I started with that template and then I modified it to meet our own needs. So I could send both surveys um, to whoever needs them. Great, thanks so much. And then this will be the last question before we move on um, to Donna. But Vince, could you tell us a little bit more about the partnership that you have with the farmer's market? Um, do you have a fund so that children and their families can take home tom tomatoes? Basically, how do you fund that? Um, and was it in partnership with SNAP, WIC, or a Double Up Bucks program? If you could just talk a little bit more about how you are able to fund that portion for your family. Yeah, so a lot of the partnerships, a lot of the activities we've been doing at Farm to School in the past year and a half has been made possible with the USDA Farm to School grant, specifically an implementation grant. Um, but even in addition to that, the community partners that we have with Dairy Council, Center for Eco Literacy, already have existing grants. And a lot of our visions and goals overlap. So just partnering out to them um, makes for, for great synergy. Awesome. Thank you both again so much. Um, oh, I missed my cute little question slide here during that, um, but we'll see it again at the end of Donna's presentation. Um, so Donna, why don't you take it away? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, farm to school is definitely one of my most favorite topics to talk about, and summer is the perfect time to have a farm to school program operating. And like Emily said, I always like to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, so you're going to hear all the good things and all the bad things that we learned and how we overcame them. So I wanna first talk a little bit about who we are and where we are in Georgia. So if we can look at the next slide. 
will show you in Georgia. We are a very large rural county. And um, let me go back. Okay, sorry. We're a very large rural county, about 836 square miles, right in the middle of Georgia. And we have a high unemployment rate. And we have 100% of our kids eat at no cost. We are totally CEP. We have about 4,200 students and five schools. And our summer feeding, we offer food at over 160 sites. We go all over the county with school buses. So I'll talk a little bit about that as I talk about our program. But what are the advantages we've seen for doing farm to school? It certainly has lowered our carbon footprint as we have over about 10 or 12 farmers that deliver to us and they're all within 50 mile radius. Um, it enriches our local economy. We spend between $150,000 to $200,000 on local food. The food is so much fresher and tastes so much better when it's 24 hours from the farm into the children's bellies. You can't get any better than that unless you lived on the farm. Um, our students and teachers love having all the extra ag education. Our farmers come into the classroom and in the summer they get on the buses and go around and certainly um, we need more farmers so we're always trying to encourage that to our students to grow up and become a farmer. We want it to be a glamorous lifestyle for the, the kids to think about. Um, and our farmers love farm to school because they do not like standing on the side of the road selling 2,000 watermelons. <laughs> They'd much rather bring them to the schools and drop them off and go home and watch TV. So our farmers love um, farm to school program. And our kids and parents think that the meal quality is so much better. And our teachers, we know that when we offer farm to school, in the class in school that our teachers eat twice as much as the vegetables as our kids eat twice as much. So what is the bad and the ugly? The bad and the ugly is that we've had to do a lot of training with our farmers and I'm going to talk to you about that about how to package, deliver, and charge for food. They know how to grow the product but they have no idea how to package it, process it, and deliver it. And then in the South, we have lots of hurricanes and tornadoes and floods. And sometimes we're expecting to get watermelons and the fields are flooded. Our the hurricanes come and our collars get washed away. So that is always something we worry about. And then with farm to school, you have to worry about the storage of the product. So do you have extra walk-in coolers and freezers that you can store the product in? And then the last thing is quality control. If you look in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, those are some of the sweet potatoes that we got. So we obviously could not even fit one of those on a tray for a student. And so we have to worry about quality control and how do I deal with that with my staff and how do they cut up the product. So I'd love to say you better not squash the opportunity to eat real food. And it, does it take a little bit more time? Yes, it does. But really the difference is your children will eat so much better than they've ever eaten without doing farm to school. So where do you start? Certainly with your menu. So this is our summer feeding menu. And if you look at the pink row in the summer, we have access to apples, blueberries, plums, peaches, and nectarines, all local. So we are able to, on our buses, offer fresh fruit every day that is local. We also have access to cucumbers, and I've always put the ranch dip on there. We have a local ranch dip that we make ourselves that I, I always say the kids would eat cardboard with our ranch dip. They love it so much, but we prefer them to eat vegetables with it. So cucumbers, cherry tomatoes, broccoli, carrots, and then on Friday we do a mixture of raw vegetables. It's easy to incorporate this on a very simple menu, but if you have a more complicated menu, you can also incorporate it there. So the next thing is, how do you find your farmers? Well, we went to the Cooperative Extension Agency and said, do you know who the farmers are? And they said, of course we do. So we sent them all a letter and said, come for a meeting. And when we told them what we did and all the meals that we serve, they said, we can grow for you. So the upper right-hand corner shows all the things that they said they could grow for us. And I always said I would take anything they would grow except a truckload of radishes. Although I understand radishes are becoming popular, so I may have to change my mind on radishes. But 
If you don't have a cooperative extension agency, you can always talk to the ag department in the school system or check with other school districts or your state and national farm to school organization. Or even stop at a local farmer's market and say, hey, wouldn't you rather grow for me than stand out here in the hot sun? You'll get plenty of people to want to grow for you. So what do we do once we find a farmer? How do we correspond with that farmer and learn about that farmer? So this is our Farm to School vendor application, and this is all on my website, so you can download it. There's my website down below. Just Google Burke County Public Schools in Georgia and go to our Farm to School thing, and all these links are on there. So we want to find out from them some basic information about the farm farmer's name, the business name, phone number, and then find out about how big is your farm. We don't want something in somebody's just backyard that's a half an acre. And then how many acres you have in production. And then we want to find out where they're located so we know how to score them in terms of giving them extra points for the closer they are to us. We want to find out if they sell to other school systems so that we can get references. That's always helpful. We give them pictures to show what a 50 mile radius from us and a 100 mile radius is. So if their farms are in that area, they know how many extra points they're gonna get for being more local. Then we continue to ask them questions like, do you have liability insurance? And we have to see the proof of that insurance. And we ask them if they're willing to let us come out and do farm inspections. We go out and do farm inspections on any farm that we accept food from. We have very precious cargo that we're feeding and we want to make sure that our food is safe and sanitary and we inspect all farms before we allow any food from them. We also ask if they're willing to do a farm tour, host a tour for us because that's something we're always looking for, the places for the students to go. We ask if they have any certifications like GAP certifications or they are organic or anything like that. We don't require those, but that does give them extra points if they do. Then we also get into if they've had any training on produce training and um, give us proof of training they've gone to. We ask them if they're willing to deliver the product to all five of our schools or if they're only willing to deliver it to one location. How much lead time do they need if they're growing strawberries and cutting them and getting for us? Can we give them two days notice or do they need two weeks notice? Um, we also ask if there's a minimum amount that they, we have to order from them in order for them to deliver to us. And then what happens if they deliver products that are not acceptable? Are they willing to offer credits or, or what is their return policy? Then we get into looking at their farm and production practices. So do they test their water annually on the farm that they water their product, their farm products with? Do they clean and sanitize their processing equipment? Um, do they um, have a good source of water and um, it's not cross contaminated with manure, livestock and pets and things like that? And then if they do use raw manure, we ask them if it they only put it on at least two weeks prior, prior to planting or 120 days prior to harvest, questions like that. Then we ask them how they're gonna transport the food to us. Is it gonna be in a safe, appropriate thing that is clean and temperature controlled if it needs to be? How much time does it take from cutting the product to, get, to delivering it to the school? Um, can, do they have any way of tracing the product? So if we were to have a foodborne outbreak, could we trace the product back to them? Do they have anything in place for that? And then um, also we ask if they um, have one location where they're, they're growing the food or multiple locations so that we can go and look at all of those locations. The next thing we do is we actually get a bid from them. So this is a sample bid, and these are some things that we ask them to bid on, collards, cabbage, white acre peas, and we tell them how we want them cut. We want them ribbon cut and washed, the, the collards, that we want them stored at temperature 33 to 41 degrees. We want the packaging ventilated. These are the dates that we're gonna use it. So we use it during the year and during the summer, how much we need delivered, things like that. So. So they need some idea of how much product they are gonna grow for you. So this is a very important form to give to them when you're getting ready to get a bid from them. The next thing we do is we get 
get after we've gotten the bid from them, we then award the bid. And so we look at is the bid done in a timely manner? Will they allow us to come do a farm inspection? How far is it away from us? How is the cost? Is it the lowest cost? Are they going to deliver it to all the schools or just to our warehouse? Are they going to package it and label all the product? How fast from the harvest date does it get to us? Are they willing to do farm tours? Do they have insurance? Are they GAP certified? All of those questions go into us awarding the bid. Once we've awarded the bid, we kind of give them a delivery schedule and we say, okay, for cantaloupe, you've got the bid for cantaloupe this summer. We're going to need deliveries on June 8th and July 6th. We need 308 cantaloupes. These are the schools we want you to deliver them to. So they know exactly when to deliver them and exactly how many they want we need delivered to the school. The next thing we do is you want to try and help them. One of the hardest things for them is how they process the food and what it looks like and how do we want it bagged. And there's lots of different ways to do it. So we allow the farmers some, give them some information on how to do it. We let them choose how they're going to do it, but we make sure we know how they're going to package it. So when we're ordering it, we order it correctly. So I'll give you an example. Like one time we were ordering cabbages and we thought we were ordering 50 pounds and instead we ordered 50 heads of cabbage. So it was not exactly correct. So you've got to be very, very, specific and how much processing do you want? Do you want the cabbage whole or do you want it shredded because you're going to use it for coleslaw? So there's lots of charts out there that can help you do this. This shows you how you can package fruit. So we get apples in the summer and in the fall in our program and when you get a 40 pound box, if we're going to put them on the buses, we're hoping to order 1,500 apples, it's going to make a difference what the count and the size of the apples are on the box. So if we get the 72 count box or we get the 150 count box, it's going to make a difference. So you need to know that information when you're getting ready to order. So make sure that you're very clear with your farmers and they let you know what the counts are in their cases and in their boxes of blueberries, blackberries, whatever it is that you're ordering. The next thing are vegetables. They're much harder to order. So, you know, if you're ordering corn on the cob, do you need it shucked or do you need it um, on, will you take it on the um, not shucked? My managers would kill me if I took it not shucked, but if it was a small school or a small, you know, group, then maybe you could afford to do it that way. We want the peas shelled and, fro and frozen or shelled and fresh. How do you want them? So, this gives you some really good ideas and all these materials are available in the reference section for you. So does farm to school take more time? Yes, it does at times. And so you have to be real careful to get your staff on board. So in, in other words, like in the summer, if we're cooking peas they, and they're fresh, they take so much longer than cooking canned or frozen. If we're doing grits for breakfast in the summer, we get local grits. They take 45 minutes to cook versus 10 minute grits. So you need to be real careful that your staff knows why you're doing it and that they know the benefits of it. And then sometimes the farmers want you to come out, out and help them unload their trucks and things like that. So your staff needs to be really, really prepared and ready, but then they also get the benefits of farm to school because they like the taste of it too. Don't forget to market what you're doing to your parents and your community. This has been the best PR we have done for our program totally. The news stations love to come out and hear you talk about farm to school. And if you call them up, they'll come in a minute. It's a happy story and they like to do those happy stories. And the newspaper loves to do articles about how they're, you're buying farm to school stuff for your kids and, and they love to interview the farmers. So make sure you do all that. It's a great PR for you and the farmers for your program. The other thing we did is we started a farmer's market so that our farmers could sell the same produce in the summer to our parents and the community as we're using in our program. And this has been a huge marketing thing for us so we can tell the parents what we're doing for our kids, but it's also been great for our farmers because they get to sell more. And when you look at that slide on the right and that child picking up all that produce, it just puts the biggest smile on my face. So what do we do about insurance, gap certification, board contracts, and bidding? So I'm going to talk about each one of those things individually. 
you definitely have to have product liability insurance and that is to protect your farmer in case your kids were to get sick and be hospitalized you definitely would want your farmer to have that kind of insurance to pay for hospitalization or injury or anything like that and so it is required usually by grocery stores and, and other places, but we definitely require it in the school. And we require usually a million dollars of product liability insurance cover, coverage. And we tell the farmers to go to the Farm Bureau and they can help them get liability insurance. It's not very expensive. GAP is not something that is required in school nutrition for the summer or anytime, but we do talk to the farmers about this because it's great. It allows them to develop a um, food safety plan and it, it teaches them good agricultural practices and good farm food safety practices and it makes them document what they're doing and it makes them much more aware. It's like serve safe training for the farmers. And so a lot of my farmers have gone and gotten this, but it is not required. So one of the things that my farmers have really, really struggled with is what to charge, how much to charge, and how to create an invoice. So we talked to the farmers about using the market bulletin for pricing that they have access to, and it shows what, if they went to the farmers mar state farmers market, what is the going price for strawberries and blueberries and peaches. We also let them have access to the weekly bids that we get from our local produce vendor. So they have some idea of how to price their product and be competitive. And then we actually do word processing and Excel classes with our farmers to teach them how to create an invoice because they absolutely have no idea to do that. So sometimes we just do a template for them, which they really, really do appreciate. So in terms of the invoice, it's real important that they understand what has to be on the invoice and that we have to have a separate invoice for each location they're delivering to and that we have to have the date on there and they have to itemize. They can't just put an invoice for $200. We have to know whether it was for peaches or blueberries or blackberries or whatever it was they were delivering and the quantity and it has to be totaled and it has to be, have an invoice number and things like that. And that seems simple to us, but it is a very complex thought process for them and something that we've had to work with them on. We do lots and lots of training with them. We have two or three trainings a year getting ready for summer and getting ready for the bid process. And we, we talk to them about how to fill out the bid documents and we do food safety training with them and we talk about how to do um, forward contracts. So we talk to them about, so if they want to grow cabbage for us, how much cabbage are we going to need? And what's the volume? And, and, and that we, when we commit to bid cabbage or blueberries or cherry tomatoes with them, what are we talking about? And that we will definitely honor that contract. So we do a lot of training with them. So you have to be very flexible and anybody that works in summer feeding already knows this. So what happens, what are your contingency plans? So what happens when your farmer crops fail? So we always keep a backup of frozen vegetables and canned vegetables and canned fruits. And we always keep apples and oranges in our coolers because they'll last for a long time in case the the um, hurricane comes and all the watermelon is swept away, which happened to us one year. Uh, what happens if a farmer has more crop than he can sell and he calls us up and says, I have tons and tons of this item, then we call that an opportunity buy. And so we say, what kind of a deal can you make us on that product? And usually they can. And then we buy it and we rotate it into our menu in the summer. So what happens when a farmer calls you with an item that you've never used? What you can see that picture there, if anybody knows what, that's a cucamelon. And this farmer called and said, I have all these cucamelons. Would you like them? And we said, yes, we would. So we gave them to the kids with some ranch dressing and they loved them. What happens when a hurricane hits? A hurricane hit and our collards got nasty, dirty, and they delivered them to us and they were unedible or they wash something away, you have to be prepared for that. And then what happens when the product is bad? We've had several situations where they delivered peas to us and they didn't process them correctly. They got hot, they sprouted, they were sour. 
Sometimes we've had so many bugs in our peas that we had to turn the product back. So what do you do and how do you work with the farmer to, um, you know, because he's given you $1,000 of the product and he's expecting to be paid. So usually we work it off and, and kind of, you know, pay him and then work it off of his next invoices. So what are some of the things that we serve locally? Collards are big here in the South. I know they're not big all over the country, but um, our kids love collards. Corn on the cob is something our kids absolutely adore. Um, and peas, purple hull peas, white acre peas, and butter beans. And we eat those fresh all summer. And then um, we also store them during the year for the winter time. But in the summer, they are amazing. We also do sweet potatoes. And when they're this big, we have to cut them in like thirds or at least halves. Peaches, we do them on the bus every single week. And sometimes when our peach crop is late, our kids on the buses are saying, where are the peaches? Where are the peaches? They're just so used to having them. Honeydew and cantaloupe is a big hit in the summer and easy to source and easy to serve. We had a farmer call us and said he had red potatoes. I didn't have a recipe for red potatoes. So we now do ranched red potatoes with ranch dressing and we bake them in the oven. Our kids would prefer those over French fries. Broccoli with ranch dressing is a hit raw or cooked. And then cabbage, we love cabbage in the summer. You can do coleslaw on those hot dogs that you're doing. It is yum. We also get whole wheat flour. We make our own rolls and cinnamon rolls and cucumbers are our kids' number one favorite vegetable with, with ranch dressing, who knew? We also do strawberries. Who would not eat strawberries? This is actually how we started in farm to school, the strawberry patch. I drove by it every day on the way to work and I stopped in one day and said, could we buy lots and lots of strawberries? They said, yes, you can. And that launched us into summer feeding along with watermelons. One of my managers was growing watermelons and we brought watermelons from her and started with watermelons. Our kids, that's probably their favorite fruit. It's my favorite fruit. We also do yellow squash in the summer, squash casserole our kids love, and we sometimes do beef and pork, but not very often. We also do cherry tomatoes all summer in our salads and is also with ranch dressing and we don't do very much organic because it's expensive, but sometimes we get opportunity buys and we're able to do organic. We do aquaponic lettuce. We have an aquaponic house that grows lettuce for us and we do whole grain grits and cornmeal that are locally sourced for our cornbread. The so last thing I wanted to talk about was the farm to school grants. That these grants, um, they usually have $10 million in funding and the proposals are usually due in mid-December and they award them every spring. And it used to be 5 million in funding and it has increased to 10 million. And there's three different grants. You can get a planning grant and that's for people that are just starting out and that's twenty to fifty thousand dollars just to kind of get you up and going and if you've kind of been up and going you can get an implementation grant that's fifty to a hundred thousand dollars and that'll get you more than up and going and then if you're a state agency you can also get a grant for fifty to a hundred thousand dollars. So what are the results of doing farm to school in the summer? These are our kids and our happy customers and what I want to say is our future farmers. And if you look on the right picture, that is my measure of how well are we doing and that is a clean, empty plate. And that's what I want to see after the kids eat. And when you do farm to school, you are guaranteed a clean, empty plate. So I like to say we're changing the way our children eat, which changes their lives. And I think farm to school definitely changes the way our kids eat. And they then take it home to their parents and teach them how to eat better too. We even have an early Head Start program. We have kids eight weeks to three years old that eat all of our farm to school program year round. And so I love starting them early. So I like to say we root for students that we root for farmers and we root for the community. It is a great program. Back to you, Emily. Thank so, you so much, my Donna. Resources. Sorry, these are my resources. No, we'll leave them up there for people to look at. Um, thank you again so much, Donna. That was so much great information. Um, I know that I learn every time I hear you speak. 
Um, so just thank you again so much. And now we have some time for questions, um, which a couple have rolled in. So if you have questions, go ahead and submit those in the question box. Um, but we have our first one from Sarah from Feeding San Diego. Um, Donna, do you procure food from one farmer who provides everything that you're looking for, or do you procure from multiple farmers um, who bid on specific food items? We definitely do multiple farmers. And the first, when we first started the program, we had just one or two farmers bidding on certain things. But when the word got out that we pay regularly and that we have a large volume that we're looking for and that it's, we're easy to work with, we now have multiple farmers bidding. And so we start the bidding process right now in February so that they can start planting. When we award the bids in March, they can start planting for the spring and the summer. So we have multiple farmers. So until they get the bid awarded, they don't start planting, but we have three or four bidding on every single item that we procure. Great. Um, Vince, are you, on the, are you still on the line? Can you tell us maybe answer the same question? Do you procure from multiple farmers? Yeah, we buy it from eight farms. Um, Great. And, and it's our third year um, purchasing with them. And at this point, they're dedicating like a quarter or half their farm to the district. That's awesome. Um, okay, another question for Donna. Can you talk about how you staff the farm to summer aspect of your summer program? Um, what is the background of this staff um, who handle all of these duties related to farm to summer? And I know you have the benefit of working with them school round, school year round, um, and lots of training has gone in, but maybe you can speak a little bit to how you've built the skills for your staff to be able to work with local produce. Well, I'll tell you, um, Emily, it has been trial and error with all of us because I was new to farm to school when we started. And like I said, we literally started because the manager called and said she had some, you know, watermelons. And then I passed by the strawberry place and that's how we started. We started really, really small. And when we saw how beneficial those few items were, then we decided to start going bigger. And so I worked with a cooperative extension agent here in the county who knew a lot more about farming and safety and sanitation and, and knew who the farmers were. But um, I hired a dietitian who had an interest, a strong interest in farm to school. And so I have a full-time position and part of her duty, she's my wellness dietitian and does farm to school. And that job seems to be kind of, you know, every two or three years, that person seems to move away and then I have to start all over. But um, so there are lots and lots of trainings going on in everybody's straight states. There, um, George Organic says a lot of training. Um, the National Farm to School conferences are great to go to. There are so many resources at the National Farm to School Network, Kansas, Washington State, Georgia Organics, and my resources, they have so many tools and tips, and you just have to read up, but, but you know, literally, we, um, there are so many resources out there that we have just kind of learned by trial and error, and when we'd have a problem, then we would strengthen our procurement process, and we just kind of kept learning and kept learning, and I, my biggest thing with the farmers is I know that they put their heart and soul into growing for us and I develop a really close relationship with them and I want to treat them right. And I know that they are not wealthy and they are on a small budget. And so when things happen, if it's something they don't know, then I kind of split the cost with them when they ruin product and they didn't know what they were doing and we didn't know any different than I take half of the loss and they take half of the loss. We learn from it, we grow, but that makes them very um, addicted or very supportive of my program and they, they support me and, and work with me. And sometimes we have to call them and say, oh, by the way, we are canceling school and we don't need a delivery and they they're very understanding when i'm understanding they're understanding so it's just a, a lot of back and forth and back and forth and learning and growing awesome thanks donna um the next question we have is 
if you're a nonprofit sponsor and you'd like to implement Farm to Summer and you're just starting out, um, but you might have limited staff or knowledge on staff about Farm to Summer, where should you start? Um, I'll start off by answering some of that and really just echoing a lot of what Donna said. And then please, Donna, Lori, Vince, jump in. Um, but I think your ag extension, your local or your state level ag extension office is a really great resource. Again, as Donna said, just call them up to find where um, good farmers you might be able to work with in your area are. And I would say really start building relationships with those farmers in your area. Find out what they're growing. Um, you know, Donna mentioned minimally processed fruits and vegetables. I think that's a great place to start that doesn't require a lot of um, staff cutting, you know, heads of cabbage into coleslaw, um, but maybe working and getting some local apples, um, getting some local cucumbers and just slicing them and starting off with a couple local items and really maybe summer 2020 is just testing the waters and not trying to jump in too deep, but really working with some local farmers um, and securing some minimally processed fruits and vegetables from them. Um, I would also caution to make sure it's something that kids like. Um, you never want to order a bunch of fruits and vegetables that your kids maybe aren't um, so accepting of. So um, doing some of that checking in with the, the kids and families that you're serving is also an important reminder for every aspect of your summer meals program. Um, Donna, Lori, Vince, do you have anything to add? Again, nonprofit sponsors um, might not have the luxury of the big kitchens that you have at schools or the staff who are on maybe year round um, and certainly unfortunately don't have access to their, those farm to summer grant or the farm to school grants that the USDA provides that those are just for schools. Um, schools can use them for their summer um, food program. But again, that's a grant that's only available to schools, unfortunately. Um, do you have anything to add to words of wisdom that you might share for a nonprofit sponsor who might just be starting out? This is Lori. I, I think what you said is really good. I would pretty much rely on the partners in your community to give you some advice and support. And I would say look at, at what who's on the side of the road growing and selling stuff. You'll know exactly what's in season and what's available, you know, that's easy to access. And I think, Emily, your point about doing things that the kids really like, I think, you know, blueberries, strawberries, peaches that don't require, you know, blackberries as a treat, things like that don't require a lot of processing, nectarines, um, plums that don't require a lot of processing are easily easy to put out and um, will get you started down the road and then then you can expand as you as your staff you talk to your staff that's the other thing is talk to your staff and see if they have some ideas sometimes they may tell you oh I would love to try and do some you know green beans or wouldn't it be great if we did you know some squash so sometimes they'll surprise you and say Oh, I love to cook this, so I want to do that. And, you know, you can do squash, yellow squash, and do it with ranch dressing. If you do ranch dressing, I'm telling you, the kids will eat anything. And, and just squash and broccoli and cucumbers are so easy to cut up and, and serve with some ranch dressing. Great. Every farm to summer or every summer meal sponsor on the line today has to go um, procure some ranch dressing for their for their program this summer so that they can get their kids to eat lots of veggies. <laughs> um, we have really great questions rolling in. Um, Donna, what sites do you work with? You work with schools and where else? Um, well, I'll, I'll start by yeah, we saying have a, that Donna... Um, buses that go out and they go to the library, to the rec department, they go to um, camps. We do camps. We do... Um, in any place where five to 10 people gather, we will take food there. So we do it all over. Like I said, we have 160 sites. We do all over the community. Most are on buses, but we also take vans and, and you know, do camps and um, anything that's going on in our community, we will deliver food to. Yeah, thank you so much, Donna. A lot of her sites are on are on school buses themselves that go out in the summertime um, and really reach kids where they're at and get closer to where they live. 
Um, so the kids board the bus and eat their summer meals um, on the school buses too, in addition to all of those many community sites that Donna has. Um, okay, I think, I know Donna, you can speak to this a little bit, um, Vince as well, probably you. What kind of equipment and facilities do farmers have to have to do the processing that you guys alluded to or talked about? Um, I know that not every farmer has access to um, equipment that can have them easily cut, wash, and bag produce that you might use in your um, program. So could you talk a little bit about the equipment that they use, um, if it's changed over time, how they've been able to procure equipment um, so that they can source food to your programs, if you can talk a little bit about that. That's a great question. Um, it, most of the farmers um, that I know are using food processing hubs. And they're usually located all around the state in different areas. And they can rent time to go use the processing equipment there. And those are always safe and sanitary and air conditioned and things like that. But I do have some local farmers that they went in together and bought a processing machine that they all share um, and use together because they um, to cut the collards and things like that. And most, some of that equipment is between seventy-five and a hundred thousand dollars uh, processing machine to cut and that'll cut and chop different kinds of vegetables and things like that. But most of them find somebody that has it and rent time or rent space or go to a food processing hub. And you can go online and Google food processing hubs near you and you can find out where they are. And similar to that in the Tomas, I think um, a lot of lessons learned within the past years of doing farm to school, um, in addition to processing centers, our central kitchen has turned into a processing center ourselves. Um, we've learned knife skills and how to wash lettuce and how to break down collard greens, watermelons, uh, zucchini. So our staff know how to handle whole produce know how to take these things and turn it into um, things that are compliant within the food buying guide. Thank you both. Um, I'll take one more question. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to get to all of them today. Um, but I let's answer. Do either of you um, have ways to I guess, Vince, you talked a little bit about this. Um, if you have produce for families to take home, are they picking them up from um, the feeding sites that you have that children are attending? Um, they're looking for some ways to procure some local produce for families as well. Um, and so I know you talked about funding that, but, and, and Donna, you talked a little bit about the market, but if you can talk a little bit about how families are able to benefit from this as well, that would be great. Yeah, so I'll start off. Um, in addition to Farm to School Grant, uh, the USDA Farm to School Grant, um, we work with a local food pantry within our district to hand that out. So within the regulations, we can't operate that, but we help assist in the transferring of um, leftover foods from our school sites. Um, but I strongly recommend the Farmer school grants along in addition with other grants within the state and local agencies. Our farmer's market has been huge to encourage. It's in um, a local bank has given us their property to use and they advertise on their signs and like that. And we put it in the newspaper and we um, advertise all week long. And so that has been a way that we have encouraged our community to get more involved with farm to school and they are so enthusiastic about it. We send out emails to all of the staff in the school district, which is 700 staff, reminding them about the farmer's market and what, we're, what vendors are bringing that week to get them excited because it may be blueberry season or blackberry season or peach season or nectarines or things like that. And the fruits and the peas seems to get everybody there more than other things. So when we let them know what in collars and what we're going to have, then it gets them excited. So that's our way of getting more farm to school into the community. Thank you both. 
Um, I also want to mention that on our previous webinar last month, we had a community-based sponsor at a YMCA who worked to, um, he has a mobile program with a food truck, but he was able to get um, produce that were kind of seconds from local farmers and then was able to have those for families at their summer meal sites. Um, and he actually did that by giving kids kind of monopoly money to teach them how to buy and manage their money by local produce, even though it was free to them and their families. Um, so there's lots of innovative ways out there. Um, and again, I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to all of our questions, but we are at time. Thank you so much for joining today and to our wonderful panelists. I learned so much and you have really done a great job selling Farm to Summer. Um, I want to quickly just make you all on the line aware today. Um, our No Kid Hungry program innovation team is looking for some summer meal sponsors, 10 pilot partners to test a couple ideas um, to reach more kids with summer meals. And so that comes with a $10,000 grant and some technical assistance. So again, this slide deck will be going out afterwards, but you can apply by clicking the links um, once this is in your inbox for um, testing adult meals or testing different activities. And you can learn more about those grant opportunities there. Um, and lastly, we would love for you to register for our next webinar, which is Strategies to Improve Your Summer Meals Experience for Kids and Families, which we will also send out um, in your inbox. Thanks again, everyone, for joining today, and I hope you have a great rest of your Tuesday.